Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim My Gard. guest is Ross Kay, homeownership consultant at the WealthyHomeowner.ca, Canada's authority on home ownership. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Thanks for having me on, Jim. Uh, belated uh, happy Thanksgiving. Well, thank you very much. Hope you and your family enjoyed your turkey. Yes, we did. And I always like to remind our American friends, Canada started celebrating Thanksgiving 60 years before you did. There you go. So thank you. Once again, Canada leads the way. Um, Also, there's a whole bunch of other things, but, you know, the Canadian inventions, the zipper, pablum, and uh, most importantly, the push-up bra. Ross, (laughs) we're, we're, we're hearing a lot about adding a wealth tax as a solution to pay for the lockdown deficit what would a wealth t- tax do to the housing market? Well, what it would do is, I would think whatever party brings it in, Jim, would, would find that they're going they're not going to win the election. Because when you live in a country of homeowners, like we are in Canada here, if you're going to decide you're going to attack the wealth on a false narrative created by those who don't own a home, um, I think the uh, voters that would... Uh, would really reject what you're offering. Now, you could maybe do it, uh, you know, really, really deceptively by, by being quiet about it and not telling people what you're going to do. But I think the next time around, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed of getting kicked out. I think, Jim, this is a, this really is a great discussion that goes to a lot of the, a lot of the episodes that we've had here on the show where we've talked about wealth, home ownership wealth and the general ignorance that it, that it surrounds it. In other words, the ignorance of the people who have it themselves and, and in terms of what they're able to do with that wealth or the way they need to protect that wealth or the way they need to grow that wealth. Um, but it also has something to do with the economists and those who oversee policy in, in your country. Uh, back in 2019, 2019, you know, it, all the talk is Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is so rich, the richest man in the world. They're gonna, he's gonna split his money with his wife through the divorce and, and, uh, she's gonna be the richest woman in the world. And we always, and, and then they use these combinations, these, these conversations about the top 1% has as much wealth as the bottom 60%. Crazy comments like that. And uh, I say they're crazy because clearly no one is calculating the largest asset class in the world, which is home equity. Home equity is the largest asset class in the world, but nobody talks about it. It's like it doesn't exist. Everybody says about, oh, you can't talk about a house because it's not liquid. You can't get rid of it. I can tell your listeners, I can get rid of any house anywhere in Canada at market value less 10% in seven days, okay? I can get rid of real estate just as quickly as I can in stocks. The truth of the matter is, is that in a correcting stock market, you can't get out of your your stocks quick enough in the same way that you can of your home. You can get rid of your home as quickly as you need to get rid of it, right? You can get cash in hand within seven days, and the loss that you would take would be far less than what would be possible in a stock market. I understand that realtors want the conversation to be that real estate is a liquid. Oh, it's going to take you three months to get rid of it. Stock promoters, stock advisors, financial advisors, they want to all use this false narrative to, to not get you to buy a house or to not get you to trade up to a more expensive home. Okay, I can understand that's what they're doing. But these are all simply false narratives. Practically speaking, this is not true. In other words, any client that I had who wanted to get rid of their real estate, I could liquidate their real estate. They got cash in hand just as quickly as if it would have been a stock market. 
Now, what I can say is I can count on my two hands the number of people who wanted their cash out in uh, two weeks, a two week, or excuse me, one week period of time. There was a lot more who wanted in a couple of weeks. But those, I didn't have one single instance where I couldn't liquidate those people's houses. And the reason why it's so liquid is you only need to have a small percentage decrease in the price of your home that immediately makes it the most attractive home in the market in your price category. When we talk about wealth, this wealth tax, okay, you're darn well right. Sooner or later, you're going to have some socialist government, some left-leaning government in Canada or the United States, who's going to realize because of the silence on the home equity as an asset class, people really don't know how much money's sitting there. So let me tell your listeners a little story. Because it, the, when Bezos was uh, divorcing his wife, and they were talking about splitting up the wealth that he had at the time into, into her equal share, or the share that she had negotiated uh, when they got together, um, this is what the truth is. The truth is, Burlington and Ontario homeowners, the homeowners in just those two little tiny cities had more net wealth in their homes than Jeff Bezos did in his owning of Amazon. Just two little cities, Burlington, Ontario, and Oakville, Ontario. The homeowners in those two cities had more home equity wealth than Jeff Bezos did in Amazon wealth. So let's just stop this ludicrous comments about the wealth inequality. When you hear wealth tax, realize what the government is saying. You work every day to earn your income and pay income tax on it. Hopefully you've structured your, your earnings and your tax bill so you paid the lowest amount of tax as possible. Because every Canadian should be taught in elementary school and again in high school and then in post-secondary that the tax code in Canada actually states that you should structure your affairs to pay the lowest tax possible. This is the CRA's own words. Structure your affairs to pay the lowest tax possible. That means the government sets the rules, you look at the rules, and you play by the rules to your advantage. Don't break them. Just play by them. The result of that is homeownership wealth is the largest asset class in this country. What the, the 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 middle class of a country. The middle. I, I look. I encourage all of your listeners out there. There's an economist, Jeff Rubin, who was formerly with CIBC. Jim, if you can get him on to do a show, do a show. He's just released a new book, and uh, he talks about the middle class, the destruction of the middle class. Now you've got to understand with Rubin, he was a wealth management chief economist with CIBC for years. So this is this is an actual what I would call a banker, a banker, a salesman for the banker CEOs, so that the bank CEOs stock price increases in value. Um, he's now coming out and explaining uh, the reality uh, that no one wants to talk about, and that is how the trade deals across North America, free trade. Uh, and in, I'm just going to use the Ontario case, the destruction of the auto pack and replacing it with NAFTA, how it wiped out the middle class. But what I would also say is that when we talk about a wealth tax, a wealth tax actually is a tax on the middle class. It's not in the wealthy as they portray it to be. Because if you listen carefully to the ongoing conversation right now, they're targeting $400,000 um, of, of earnings to, uh, to be the next tax bracket increase. Well, that's not going to get them enough money because wealth is based on leverage. And to get at that leverage, they're going to have to tax assets. So if they want to hit a, a wealth tax on those with a net wealth over 400000 that means a large share of Canadian homeowners would be taxed on that wealth. We're already hearing them talk about, oh, the, cra the comments about, oh, people have got so rich off their housing, they'd be tax-free. The government has structured it so that everybody puts their money in real estate. And we say hogwash. The truth of the matter is, the average Canadian who purchased a home in 1990, single detached home, the average Canadian single detached home across Canada, the homeowner has not made a penny on that home over the last 30 years. What they have done is this. They have paid off 
their mortgage. They paid a a mortgage interest probably two times what the original amount of their mortgage was. So in other words, if they took out a $100,000 mortgage, they probably paid a total of $300,000 in mortgage payments over the 25 to 30 years they had that mortgage. So they're going to recover the interest that they paid on their mortgage. They're going to recover the new roofs, the new driveways, the new windows, the new aluminum siding, the new interior, the new floors they replaced a couple of times, the brand new kitchen, the new baths, all of the things that they have basically redone their entire house, making it into a different house than what it was in 1990. In other words, it's in an apples to apples comparison. It's a totally different house. It's not even, doesn't even remotely resemble the houses before. When you take all of those expenses to own that house, the real benefit of owning a house is that you've rented the house from yourself. You were the landlord. And what, what you have done is you have covered all of the landlord's costs of owning that house over the 25 years. And now, 25 to 30 years later, so it's 1990, it's 2020 today, it's 30 years, you can get all of the money paid in rent back. That seems like it seems to be a great way to build wealth. That seems to be the great equalizer. That seems to be, wow, I can be my own landlord, meaning I can live rent-free 30 years from now. In other words, all of the money that I'm paying over these 30 years, I can get back out 30 years from now. Now, of course, you've got to say, inflation has also eaten away at that money. So in real terms, you're not going to get any actual profit from it, but you're going to recover all of that money you would have handed over to a landlord uh, renting a house from him. So when we hear these comments about wealth, we ask, why don't they discuss housing? Look at listeners, Canadian homeowners today, we're looking around a 76 to 78% home ownership rate in Canada. 76 to 78% of households in Canada own a home, okay? Go ahead. Try to win the vote of 22% of the voters. Because I'll tell you, the 78% of the voters, Jim, will kick you out of government if you touch their house. Start talking about things truthfully. When we discuss wealth, let's talk about the $4.5 trillion of wealth that's held in Canadian homes. So right now, Canadian homes are, are worth around $6.5 trillion dollars. For the sake of the argument, let's say that there's two trillion uh, two trillion dollars in mortgage debt in total owned in homes, mortgages, HELOCs, um, non-reported uh, second mor- uh, mortgages, private mortgage lending, um, anything that's borrowed against the house, including credit cards, because some of the credit cards are structured. They've gotten the credit card because it's uh, they have their house paid off, or part, or they have a lot of home equity. So let's say we take away two. You've got four point five trillion. That dwarfs the stock market, people. But it also only makes common sense that it dwarfs the stock market. Because the very first place that human beings lived was a cave. And the cave person who owned the cave was the king of the cave, or the queen of the cave. I guess back then it was probably the king of the cave, because cave men were bigger than cave women. Okay, so the next caveman came along with the club, clubbed him on the head, and took over his cave. Okay, it's the cave that matters. Your house is what matters. You need to put a roof over your head. It only makes common sense that it's the largest asset class in the world because it's the most important asset class to any family or any person. Ross, my question is, uh, as you've pointed out in previous shows, if you buy uh, a million-dollar house, you'll spend a million dollars maintaining it over 25 years. Are you going to be able to deduct the expenses of your home, including the municipal municipal taxes you had to pay on that house? So if they're going to tax the wealth in your house, you should be able to deduct building up that investment like you would if you were building a business, shouldn't you? Well, if you want to tax capital gains on housing, then you have to allow the deduction. Right? You have to tr- you have to treat it as apples to apples. Now, what I will say is this, Jim, Property taxes, I don't view in the same way that most people view them. Okay, we don't view them that way. We view property taxes as an income tax. Um, Because even if you're renting a house, you still are effectively paying all of the property taxes that your your, uh, rental unit has. 
your landlord's paying it, but he's collecting that those property taxes from you. So property tax for us, Jim, is really the first wealth tax that has ever been instituted. The reason why we fought, fought against uh, uh, market value assessment in 1990, meaning my family fought against market value assessment when it was being implemented in the early 90s, was because we understood that a property tax based on a property's value, assessed value, is actually a wealth tax. So in other words, if you have a rental unit in uh, the city of Windsor, those people, the low-income earners in Windsor, are paying more municipal income tax than multimillionaire earners pay uh, as a share of their income uh, in in, uh, in Vancouver. It is really the one real inequality, Jim, property tax, but that's a discussion for another day. But what you're saying is true. If you had spent a million dollars in 1990 on a house, you would have probably paid somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.2 million in interest, mortgage interest. You still had to pay back the principal of your mortgage. You had to improve the house. So, because in order for that house to be worth $3 million today, it couldn't look anything like it did in 1990. Because a state of the art home in 1990, Jim, had, could have had what we called white Euro kitchen, which today is called Formica. <laughs> it would never have had granite countertops. You never would have had cultured marble on, on bathroom floors. Nobody had a beautiful, um, uh, the, the type of uh, shower stalls that are installed in homes commonly today in a house in 1990. It would have been a, a pl- plastic shower surround. Uh, the basement wouldn't have been finished. Today it's fully finished. The windows would have been at best ther- uh, a thermal pane. Today they're triple glazed with an E-coating. Your furnace was an old low efficiency furnace. Today it'll be a high efficiency or it'll be a, an efficiency furnace built into your, your electrical system. You're, you're, um, you certainly don't have a house that had the same insulation factor as 99 today because you've had insulation upgraded in your home. You certainly have had at least one roof. Odds are you for are, you're right now, even if it was a brand new house, house in 1990, you're probably getting ready to put your second roof on it. And a roof today, it used to cost $3,500. That roof today is going to cost you eight to $9,000. So these are all the real discussions that need to take place when we say about, oh, these people have got so wealthy. Look, the opportunity is the same today as it was for people in 1990. The difference is this. You are going to pay a higher price for the home today, but you're going to pay less mortgage interest versus 1990, okay? You can afford to pay more today because you have to pay your le- your bank less mortgage interest. You also have to realize going forward, inflation is not going to eat your housing asset the way that it ate your housing asset from 1990 till 2008, okay? Inflation really ate away at your asset. Going forward, inflation is probably going to be 1, 2, 3% for the next decade or longer, depending on what happens with this monetary, uh, with uh, the monetary policies that they're enacting. So with your, with inflation being so low, your house doesn't have to increase up as much in value just to stay even. So, there's all of these variables, Jim, that come into play when we talk about wealth and home equity, but the, but the simple answer goes back to this. It's insane to say how rich, be, rich Bezos is or the top 1% equal to the top 50 or 60%, uh, the bottom 50 or 60%, because what's missing from this calculation is home ownership wealth, home equity wealth. Home equity wealth, which I can access for any Canadian family within seven days, and preferably within 14 days with less of a drop in value than you could experience in the stock market. So let's talk apples to apples before we start talking about taxing home equity wealth. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. 
Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, the Canadian Real Estate Association is set to release its findings for last September during this week. What do you think they're going to tell us, and how true will it be? <laughs> what they're going to tell you is this. Record, 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 record. It's a record. Well, of course it's, they're going to have to report a record. They're reporting records in uh, Ontario, Montreal. Um, they're talking about the recovery in uh, British Columbia. Uh, Alberta basically is neutral. Uh, they're talking about crazy th- crazy house prices out in, in Halifax. Of course they're going to tell you that it's records, records, records. Because they want to pump the pump the volume up for the, the rest of October, November, and as much as December as they can. That's what they want to do. So this is what happens in a correcting housing market. And especially in this particular time, because now they have instituted seasonally adjusted housing data. So in 2008 and all the years previous, all the corrections previous to that, organized real estate never produced seasonally adjusted housing data. Okay, this is the first time in history where they have organized real estate has used seasonally adjusted housing data. And that fools people. It fooled people in June, fooled them in July, fooled them in August. It's going to fool them in September. And it's going to fool them in October. And then they're going to wake up sometime in November or December and find out they were fooled. What you're seeing, folks, is a, a radical shift in the share of sales as we've said on the show before, going to the higher-priced homes selling in communities across Canada. It's so disproportionate right now that the housing bubble is inflating at a record pace for the month of September, okay? This means it beat out 2017 and it beat out 2015, the two other periods where the housing bubble is growing at its most during the month, the month of September, okay? Which, what you're hearing is the inflation of house prices – which eventually will have to be siphoned off as the market rebalances. Right now, the national sales chain is about four lengths long, so there's there's five different categories of homes that are selling, five different groups of buyers that are active in the marketplace, meaning there's four links, um, four places four places that they join. And the the majority of those sales for the last three months have been towards the more expensive homes. When you, the very first sign of a correcting housing market is when you hear local real estate agents say, oh, single detached homes are increasing, but condos aren't, are decreasing. Or condo prices are falling, single detached homes are rising. That is the moment you know a housing market is correcting fully. Because it means there's not enough first-time buyers entering the market to keep the market moving forward. It's going to pull back. When you look at your sales, Okay, so when you look at your sales for British Columbia, because they're the they're the easiest one to discuss right now. So when you look at your sales in British Columbia, we have just had uh, a July and an August where they had ten thousand sales. Never be happened before. Never before happened in history, where month after month the two sa- the two months were virtually identical in the number of sales. Remember now, folks, this has never happened before in history. The closest other period that this happened in British Columbia was March, April, March, May, April, and May of 2016. And everybody knows what happened in March, April, and May of 2016. Okay, in those three months, sales only buffeted 1,000. Okay, between uh, March and April was 400, and then again, you got the catch up 400 between April and May. You don't see this in housing markets. Okay, this is the first opportunity you've got to see it. So now that you get to see it, you have to step back and ask yourself, Ross is already telling us that the average selling price is going to be reported as up, which includes the benchmark prices, which includes the Terranet National Brights House Price Index. All housing metrics across Canada are going up. At the same time, he's telling us the market is correcting. Well, that's because you've got to look way back at your condos to see what's happening with your condos. And it's not just condos, folks. It's the lowest price condos. What are those condos selling for? How many of those are selling this month? And you're going to see it's so disproportionate. It's black, it's a black and white issue. 
So when Korea reports records, record prices, record sales, seasonally adjusted, remember what you heard in the show today. Because you've already heard this across other, other MLS systems. Oh, the market's recovering. Oh, the market's flat. Oh, or the market is rushing forward. All on when a few months ago, the opposite was being said. Meaning, a few months ago in this case means January and February. Okay? You're going to hear record, 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 record. At the same time, we say correcting, 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 correct. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, today, Polos, the former Bank of Canada governor, stated he had no fear of Canada's housing market, and he cited the economic cycle's impact on changes to wealth since you were openly critical of him the last seven years, what do you take from his words today? I take from his words today, Jim, that he remains as clueless now as for the seven years that he ran the Bank of Canada and created the largest housing bubble in Canadian history. He talks about economic cycles, and we talk about the trading cycle, okay? These guys are still hooked on their old university textbooks, Keynesian uh, economics, where they talk about economic cycles or the business cycle as if it drives an economy. And we say, no, the trading cycle drives the economy. The trading cycle leads the business cycle. The economic cycle he's talking about is the housing market. And what he's talking about is the changes that take place when uh, you, you hit a recession at the bottom of the, bottom of the economic cycle. You, you've heard a lot of talk today over the last uh, two months, about a K-shaped recovery. Now, obviously, since our logo is the letter K, my last name's K, I hate the term a K-shaped recovery, but that is also how we approach uh, we approach wealth and how we approach home ownership and how we approach housing markets. We do approach them in the shape of a K. Those who own their home are going to have a higher share of wealth uh, over the years, those who rent are going to have the bottom of the shape of the letter K. Um, this has just been common sense. What we prefer to do is we prefer to see a K-shaped recovery where the top lever on the K drops down and the bottom lever the bottom lever drops down at the same time because that means wealth is going to be accumulated by a larger share of the population. Right now, we're setting at about a about a fifty percent. The way that the, the shape of a K, the way that we would record it, uh, works. And here we have this guy saying he has no fear of a housing correction. Well, of course, it's those at the, bo- the o- owners that are at the bottom of the lever of the K that uh, are most impact- impacted by a housing market. Those who rent are most, imp- are most impact- uh, impacted by the trading cycle. And the result, it's a resulting impact on the business cycle. You didn't hear him once say today, Jim, not once, accept or even discuss what he caused to have happen from June of 2013 through till when he left. He never discussed it once. He still has his head in the sand, hoping that no one will notice, leaving the blame now to Tiff. Tiff will take the blame. These guys, you know, I just don't understand, Jim, what they're talking about. A shake, a K-shaped recovery is inevitable in any recession when because we look at a recovery and its impact on wealth. If you look down at the United States, the great housing correction of 2008 that they went through, it was a ridiculous K-shaped recovery in terms of wealth. Those at the top, the homeowners, got wealthier. Those who lost their homes to foreclosure and couldn't get back onto the market got poorer. As the mid-tier of, of wealth 
in a society. Say your uh, your uh, third, second, third, and third quintile of earners are able to buy homes. That pushes the people who are renting even further down the pecking order. Their wealth lever drops because what happens is they start to buy a second home, which they in turn rent out. And I don't know why economists or financial advisors never discuss this, Jim. But let's let's end today's show with the way that we see it. If you rent a house today for two in 1990, for, I'm going to go back to 1990 because it just makes the reference so much easier. Because everybody can fact check me. Your rent never went down once over the next 30 years. Each passing year, your rent increased. It increased at the highest increase possible by either the law or the market. But it never went down. I'm not going to talk about the nonsense that we're hearing about condo rents dropping over the last two months, Jim. I don't even want to waste my time debunking those crazy comments because they're measuring a totally different condo today than they were last year at this time. I'm not even going to discuss it. Um, and it's also going to be uh, limited in terms of its impact because, of the, because people don't want to move. Even tenants don't want to move. But over those 30 years, each year, the tenant who read it, who thought he was going to do good because all the financial advisors told him was okay, saw his rent or her rent continually increasing each year. At the same time, the homeowner continued to pay the same mortgage payment or less. They were making the same mortgage payment, but they were also paying down their principal at a quicker rate every single month with each passing month. Things were getting better and better and better. Why the tenant, it got worse and worse and worse. And it just is a little chipping away that takes place each month over 25 years that you wake up the next day, 25 years from now, 30 years from now, and you realize you missed out on this wealth gain. This is coming, Jim, from a guy who's telling people, don't buy a house right now. I'm telling you, do not buy a house right now in almost all of Canada. You have to have specific circumstances where I would recommend that you go out and buy a house because the the the, the wealth uh, that you can you're going it's going to cost you is so high. There only are certain circumstances where that cost is going to make sense. You know, maybe you have you don't have some good news. Maybe, maybe the quality of life that you're going to have over the next uh, two years is going to outweigh the a concern over a quality of life over the next 10 to 20. So there are always different circumstances. Certainly, if you're in your 80s and you want you want to trade, go ahead and move. I don't care what happens to the price of the houses. If you can afford the move and you're not going to incur a mortgage, move. It's uh, in most cases it, at uh, for the people in that age category, it's an apples to apples wealth loss and a correction, anyways. Um, but with this poll law is coming out here and talking about a K-shaped recovery, talking about these uh, terms that these things aren't real. Look at a trading cycle is real. What it does to the wealth of the of the people is real. The damage that's done because of the ignorance about it is real. What Pola is allowed to happen between June of 2013 and when he left at uh, June of 2020 is real. The damage, the, what he has caused to happen. Look, Jim, in our opinion, Polaz will have hurt more Canadian families than any politician in history, any world war in history, any, any a banker in history. The damage that he has done will hurt Canadian families for the next 50 to 100 years because it won't just be the, the next 30 to 40 years that people are living in their homes. It's going to be the generation that follows behind them because he allowed a, a bunch of falsehoods to became, become part of the Canadian homeowning fabric. He, he, he allowed realtors to believe these falsehoods. These falsehoods are so dominated uh, the conversation that everybody believes them to be true. And this is what I'll tell your listeners, when CMHC started years, decades and decades and decades ago, your listeners are going to be surprised to know CMHC was founded on a 4.5% interest rate. So you've heard all of these things about low interest rates and everything else, but I'll tell you, all of CMHC policies from the 1950s are formulated on a 4.5% interest rate. Their recommendation back then 
are the exact same recommendations that they're making now. When they made those 4.5% uh, solutions, they didn't think of in the next 30 years, the late early 80s, interest rates were going to be 17, 18, and 19, and 20 percent for a mortgage. They didn't know that from that day forward till 2020, interest rates were going to fall, that mortgage rates were going to fall. We're sitting here today with a Bank of Canada qualification rate at 4.79 percent, a mere 0.29 percent more than what CMHC used in its formation in the first rules and regulations that it launched. I don't know why CMHC does not even know its own history. This is all documentation that's available in archives across Canada, most of it digitally searched. A K-shaped recovery always happens when you measure a recovery in terms of wealth. It is the government's responsibility to make that K-shape at least harmful to the population as possible. You do that by having more, a higher share of households own homes. Just the opposite of what Evan Siddell at CMHC is preaching right now when he says we've glorified home ownership. No, Evan, we have glorified home ownership wealth as the most rational, logical, true way, natural way of, of living your life. That doesn't mean I'm telling you to go buy a house or listen to a realtor because they're the last person I'm going to tell you to listen to. What I'm telling you is there is data going back from the 1950s through till today. CMHC's policy started at a 4.5% interest rate. Interest rates are 4.79% qualifying today, even though you can get a 1.64% five-year term. Polaz is so out to lunch. It's no wonder we're in the mess that we're in right now. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me on, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthyhomeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.